Good morning, homesteaders, gardeners, and cooks. My name is Jennifer, and this is Miles Away Farm. Thanks for joining me. Um, this morning, I am going to show you uh, pumpkin granola, and I'm gonna show you how to roast a fresh pumpkin. Um, I don't have any footage of harvesting pumpkins this year because we didn't actually grow pumpkins this year. The squash that I grew was delicata and butternut, um, but this was a volunteer pumpkin that came up in my pasture. It's a hybrid um, that was an accidental cross between a regular pumpkin and a delicata squash would be my guess based on how it looks. And I had some old uh, pumpkins that um, I hadn't eaten that in March I had just thrown out to the sheep so that the sheep could eat them. And obviously one of the seeds was viable and came up and much to my surprise, because usually when that happens, they germinate way too late to get all the way mature. Um, much to my surprise, we actually got a couple of pumpkins out of this. So this is an interesting hybrid. It should be good flavor because both of its parents are great flavored, um, but I don't have footage of me harvesting this because it was just something I ran across out in the field. But I'm gonna show you how to bake pumpkin from scratch, and then you can freeze the pulp from pumpkin and um, in the batch size that you need. Side note, you can also use butternut squash, delicata squash, acorn squash. You can use any kind of squash you want in a recipe that calls for pumpkin. Um, they are all very similar and mix and match. So there's no reason to not make something just because uh, you don't have the actual pumpkin. However, I'm gonna actually show you how you bake a pumpkin. So the first thing is you're gonna need to remove this stem and I just like to whack it on something. I think that's the easiest way to do that. And then we're gonna just cut this in half and this can be a bit of a challenge. And what I like to do is instead of trying to go all the way through it, I often will work on going around This isn't super hard because it's not very old. Ooh, that's gonna be a tough one though. I think I'm gonna come at it from the other side. There we go. Ta-da. So there's our insides. You can save and roast seeds. I don't love that. Um, I find them to be really fiddly to shell when I'm eating them. And so I don't often do that. You can raise varieties of pumpkin that are hullless, so they don't have the shell on the outside of the seed. If you really want pumpkin seeds, that is a really fun thing to do. And then you can just cook up the pumpkin. You can eat it, it's not great for eating, but you can cook it up and feed it to your chickens, feed it to your livestock, um, use it for other things, and then literally just grow pumpkin, a pumpkin variety specifically for seed. I'll put a couple links to um, names of hullless pumpkins in the description. I've done that more than once, it's quite good. So just like when you carve, carve pumpkins, um, you're doing the same thing here. You're just scraping out the seeds and the strings. And honestly, this stringy stuff, it's not like it's poison, it's edible. So don't get really wrapped around the axle over this thing being perfectly clean. You get the seeds out, get the worst of the strings out. And honestly, once it's cooked, those additional strings will pull right out. So it's not really a big deal. Um, yeah, don't worry about scraping it down. It doesn't have to be that difficult. There's probably a school of thought where they don't even take the seeds out and they just plunk them down and bake them. I'm using a spoon here. Anything with a sharp edge works. Um, I've sometimes used measuring cups if they were sturdy enough. This does indeed smell like a pumpkin. All right, so there's our seeds. If you research how to bake a pumpkin, you're gonna find all kinds of different versions. There is no one right answer. Um, some places tell you to do it face up. Some places tell you to do it face down. Some places say to do it face down and to put an inch of water in the sheet. Um, some people say bake at 350. Some people say bake at 425. Um, if, you, if you ever are researching something and you find a huge gamut of different answers to how to do something, it generally means that all of them work in one way or another. I'm just going to do 350 and no need to preheat here. It's all going to cook. I'm just gonna throw that in there and I'm gonna bake that for about an hour. Um, depending on the size of your pumpkin um, and how much surface area there is and whether you're baking it front side or back side, um, it may take longer or shorter. What we're looking for is a knife to go into that um, perfectly 
uh, easily. So we're just gonna bake that for an hour and see where we get. All right, you guys, our timer has gone off. Let's see how this pumpkin looks. There she is. I'm also making chorizo, potato, and egg for breakfast, so ignore that. This outer hull is pretty hard, so I'm gonna... Ooh, that's hot. I'll flip that over and see. Not super tender yet, so I'm gonna give that another 15 minutes and see where we're at. All right, it's been 15 more minutes. Let's see what this looks like. That's much, much more tender. Yep, I think we're good. And part of the reason I like to cook mine face down instead of face up. They're a little bit more moist and sometimes you want them to be drier and so you would choose the opposite. But um, I think the moisture helps them cook. I think it helps them steam. So um, yeah, so there you go. Those are ready. We are gonna turn our oven off, let those cool, and I'll show you what it looks like when we start scooping. All right, our pumpkin is nicely cooled. I'm just gonna scrape it out of its shell. There's something very gratifying about this process. Because it usually comes away from the skin quite easily and you feel like you've gotten every last drop. And that little bit of browning on there, that's just caramelized sugar. That is not a bad thing at all. And you can see, you know, there's still a few strings in here. They're harmless, they're not gonna hurt anything, they're completely edible. But if you wanted to, you could scrape that out. Um, and it's much easier to do now that the pumpkin is actually cooked, rather than when it was still raw. And I typically, We'll get a couple of pounds. We'll see how we do here. It's usually a couple of pounds of pumpkin out of the, the pumpkin of about this size. Enough for a couple of pies or a couple of batches of granola, a couple of batches of muffins. All the pumpkin things. All right, there we go. So there's our pumpkin. And if you wanted to, you could try to mash this up and get rid of those fibers now. I tend to do a lot of things in the blender when I'm doing pumpkin, and so I don't worry about it. I just do it later when it's thawed. Um, but I like to put, I like to put a pound of pumpkin in each bag, which is basically the equivalent of a can. And that way it's ready to go for most recipes. And then if I end up with like a partial, sometimes those are perfect for recipes that call for just a cup of pumpkin, which would be about a half a can. Um, and so sometimes it's nice to have some that are eight ounces instead of 16 ounces. There we go. And I don't always bake off my squash this early in the season. It generally stores quite well um, just in a garage or a pantry. And so you don't really need to cook it in order to preserve it. Um, a lot of squash will last, you know, well into February. Um, but I wanted to show you guys how this works um, so that I could post this recipe. All right, so we're gonna 
We ended up with two pounds, 10 ounces. And some types of squash actually are much better after they've been in storage for a little while. Um, and then other squash is better um, if you eat it fairly soon after picking it. Um, and that has to do with the genus species. There's three main genus species of uh, squash or pumpkin that we grow in the US. There's a fourth one that typically only grows in the South because it's almost tropical. Um, and I will put a brief description in the description on which is which and which one do, does better. Um, most squash that we eat is pepo, zucchini, and summer squash are pepo. Um, and then a lot of the winter squash like delicata and um, acorn is also pepo. A lot of the pie pumpkins are pepo. And those are all usually pretty good um, within a couple of weeks of picking. And then there's um, Maxima, and I forget what the third one is. And those are both better if you wait a little while before you eat them. Um, the sugars concentrate over time. And so you can kind of um, decide what to plant in your garden based on when it will be the, at its prime for eating in terms of winter squash and eat the pepo varieties early in the season and then some of those other ones later in the season, like December, January, February. All right, I'm gonna put this in my chest freezer and it will be ready for the next pumpkin recipe I make. So somewhere buried down in here. Yeah, here we go. So this is all my winter squash, which is, you can see why I didn't grow pumpkin this year. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven pounds of winter squash from previous years frozen already. And then I'm adding two more. Um, so yeah, I really didn't need a lot of extra this year. There we go ready for all those great fall and winter meals. Today, I am making a quick video on a pumpkin granola. And I've been making granola for a very, very long time. And as I've gotten older and had more issues with um, my weight um, due to hormone changes and just getting older, I have uh, tried to scale back on that. And then I came to realize that the main reason that granola is so caloric is all of the nuts that get put into it. And so I actually now make granola that's basically just toasted oats with some flavorings and I don't bother putting the nuts in. You can certainly make granola with lots of nuts. And when I post this recipe, I'll post the original, um, which I think had five cups of nuts in it. Um, but I'm just gonna make this as a roasted, roasted toasted oats and use it that way. And I find it's way less caloric and I still get to enjoy granola because one of my favorite breakfasts is just fruit and yogurt and granola. So this is a pumpkin granola, which means um, obviously pumpkin. And so what went into that blender was uh, two cups of pumpkin and that was homegrown pumpkin from my own pumpkins, actually from last year, but I'll, um, at the beginning of this video, I'll have um, instructions on how to actually bake and freeze pumpkin. Um, so my own pumpkin, and then um, a, the original recipe called for a cup of honey and a cup of molasses. And I have a lot of sweeteners around right now because I've been playing with a lot of stuff. And so this is um, a corn cob syrup. And so when I processed a bunch of corn this uh, summer, I actually, after the corn was cut off the cob, I um, boiled the corn cobs and then you add sugar and molasses or brown sugar. Um, so basically it's, it's a brown sugar syrup with some corn in it. Um, so not completely on farm, but certainly a fun project. I'll post a link to that. I think uh, that 1870s homestead is where I got that idea. Um, and then I also used um, some honey, um, but instead of 100% honey, I used some of my sorghum syrup that I made this year, um, and there's a video on that. And so that's kind of a fun project. It has a very similar to molasses flavor to it, so I thought that would be a nice addition. Um, 
And so a little bit of honey, a lot of sorghum syrup. I had a, a different container of it that I used up. Um, so probably uh, six ounces of sorghum and two ounces of honey. Um, this looks really wet, so I think I'm gonna add some more oats to this. Um, and then some pumpkin pie spices. And you can buy pumpkin pie spice mix already mixed together, but it's basically made from spices you already have in your cabinet, and there's no reason to buy a separate container of it. Pumpkin pie spice is generally some version of cinnamon, ginger, um, allspice, nutmeg, and clove. And so that's what I did here. Um, but you can make it however, if you really love the taste of nutmeg in there, add some more nutmeg. If you love the taste of the cloves, add some more of that. It's easy to overdo the clove, so be careful there. Um, but yeah, make your own, it's very easy. And then a cup of oil. Um, the original recipe called for butter. I'm just not gonna use butter on a a granola, I think the butter is gonna go rancid by the time I use up this much granola. So I used coconut oil. You could also use a liquid at room temperature oil. And then seven cups of oats. But again, this recipe originally had five cups of nuts in it. And so I'm not adding the nuts. And so I'm gonna thin this out a little bit. And I mix that all in the blender because when you have homegrown pumpkin, it tends to be kind of stringy if you don't um, puree it. And then because um, everything was kind of on the cool side, I, I was hoping to get a great shot of the blender running from the top. And unfortunately, um, it had stiffened up enough with the coconut oil um, in there and then the, the honey and stuff that it, I couldn't get a good picture of it from the top because it was bogging down the blender. Um, but you get the idea here. This is gonna give you, because this is so wet, this is gonna give you nice chunks of granola, which is of course the everybody's favorite part. I think I'm gonna add. I haven't made this in a couple of years. And so I'm just kind of winging it again because I've been making granola for such a long time. You kind of have an eye and a feel for it. My biggest concern with granola is I'm trying not to have a huge amount of sugar and a huge amount of fat. I want it to be mostly oats. Um, it's really easy to think, oh, granola, it's healthy. And then when you actually look at the calories, you're basically eating a candy bar. Um, and so you really want to figure out a way to get the texture that you want, but also not have a huge, huge amount of sugar. And this is a rich recipe. This is much more rich than what I normally make, um, but this is also kind of a special occasion for the fall. It's a great way to use up um, pumpkin, and so it's just a fun thing to do in the fall. Okay, that looks about right. This recipe makes a lot, and you could, e you could easily cut it in half. I like that it uses, um, two cups of pumpkin, which is basically a pound of pumpkin, which if you're buying pumpkin out of a can in the store means that you don't have a half a can of pumpkin that you now have to figure out what to do with. And so that's part of why it's nice that it's so big. I got this giant bowl at an estate sale years ago. And man, it has saved me more than once, it is so nice to have a really big bowl. Sometimes you just need a really big bowl. So I'm just gonna kind of try to get this spread out into a single layer, smoosh it down so that it clumps up a little bit as it's baking because that's what's gonna give you the texture that you're looking for. And this is lined with parchment paper just because it makes it makes cleanup a lot easier. Things stick a lot less, but you don't have to use parchment. Um, you're just gonna have a little bit harder time cleaning off your cookie sheet when you're done. All right, this calls for 300 degrees, 60 minutes. And what I'll do is come down, set a timer for 30 minutes and I'll rotate those and change their positions in 30 minutes just in case my oven is not cooking evenly. All right, you guys, excuse my dirty stove. Let's pull this out. My kitchen smells so good right now. Oh, 
and it just I'm gonna kind of stir these and put them back in the middle of that clearly we're getting some nice browning over here and I don't want to put it back in without mixing that in but this still feels pretty wet and you know your mileage may vary there's a lot of adaption happening here because um, different pumpkins are going to have different moisture levels depending on how they were harvested when they were harvested how long they've been in storage um, this was frozen and that tends to break a lot of cell walls um, that then release a lot of moisture. Um, so it's gonna vary a lot versus what you get with a canned pumpkin that's pretty standardized. And so just be aware that you might have to bake it a little bit longer. Just keep an eye on it. But you can see here, like this is still really squishy. So not quite there, but the edges are getting nicely browned. I did turn my convection on. I have a convection setting on my oven, and I, since this was wet, I knew that um, getting some extra airflow in there was probably gonna be a good thing. And I'm just gonna flip all of this. This is my ancient, ancient spatula that I got from my stepmom when I moved out of the house and it was just kind of an extra in a drawer that she wasn't really using that she gave to me as a you know here's some stuff to get you started in your kitchen and I have no idea how old this is this is a Bakelite handle um, I moved out of the house in probably 1984 it may, it might have been a couple years after that because I was in the dorms in the college for the first year or so um, but yeah 1985 and then it probably is at least 20 years old at that point, so probably 60s. Um, and it's, I don't use it a lot because um, a lot of times when I'm flipping stuff, I'm in a, a non-stick skillet and so I don't wanna use metal. But I, I love this thing. It's, it's one of those things that I've come to really have a long relationship with when you figure how long I've had it and then how long it was around before I had it. Um, yeah, it's just kind of fun. I think this sheet has just a little bit more on it. So I'm gonna put that on top because it's gonna get better airflow if it's on the top shelf. All right, we'll give those another 10 minutes or so and I'll be back to show you what it looks like. All right, you guys, here is our pumpkin granola and what I ended up doing, I cooked it an extra 15 minutes beyond the hour that it originally called for. And then I just turned the oven off and left it in the oven so that it could um, continue to dry out. Um, this particular batch was really moist and I really wanted to make sure that by the time I crunched that up um, and put it into a jar that it wasn't gonna have some wet spots in there that would mold because that would be horrible. Um, but you can see now we've got some really nice crispy bits um, nothing seems to be particularly moist. There's a little bit in there, but not bad. Tastes delicious. And I'll post the original recipe for this that has nuts and coconut and other things in it. And then I'll put an adapted recipe for what I did here, which is just keeping it super simple. Um, but this makes quite a bit of granola. And um, yeah, it's a perfect fall treat. So enjoy. Thanks for watching, Tribe. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.